Hey there, welcome to DevCamp. My name is Chris, and in this session, we're going to talk about Meadowcore. So first of all, what exactly is Meadowcore? Meadowcore provides a common hardware API across all different types of platforms. We support our own F7 Feather and Core Compute module, which are based on the STM32, but we also support common and popular embedded Linux platforms like Raspberry Pi, Jetson Nano and AGX, the BeagleBone Black. We support the Windows desktop. We even support WSL2. The nice thing about that type of support, it means that if you've got some code for creating a driver, for example, here at the bottom, we've got a sensor that we're going to create. We pass it in a bus and address that code is the same whether I'm running on a Feather or on a Raspberry Pi or even my desktop. So when exactly do you use Meadow Core? Adrian spoke about Meadow Foundation, and that is typically the first choice as an application developer that you're going to go to. Meadow Foundation supports nearly 200 peripherals today, and we're constantly growing that. But... If you need to do something like direct hardware access, like a digital I.O., we'll talk about what those are here in a minute, raw analogs, PWMs, things like that, then going direct to Meadow Core is what you're going to need to do. Also, if you're going to create your own driver, again, we've got a bunch and we're constantly growing that number, so you might want to check with us before diving into a new driver. The third thing that you might need it for is if you have some sort of a need where you need fine control over when things are turning on and off or you're mixing multiple things, like I need to turn something on before I drive a PWM. In those types of cases, you might need to go direct to core as well. So let's talk about what a platform is. When we talk about platform in the context of Metal Core, we're talking about a specific set of hardware. On the left, you see our Meadow Feather F7. Down below that is the Meadow Core Compute. We've got Raspberry Pi, the Jetson Nano. All of these are hardware platforms with a distinct set of pins. Those pins have capabilities, but the definition of that platform is what's important. So if you look at, for example, the Feather F2, this is the platform, and circled in red here are the pins. So we have things like A0 and A1 and the D0, D1 pins. Those are accessed through the device pins collection. You can see some examples here for the F7. Now, if I was working on a Raspberry Pi, the pins look different. The pins are capable of certain things based on the hardware that they're actually on. So the Raspberry Pi 4, you can see very bottom right here, we've got a GPIO 21. Whereas on the Meadow Feather, we had things like a D01. Interestingly, on the Raspberry Pi, some people might like to use GPIO 21. Some people might like to use pin 40. We support either nomenclature. So again, here is what that looks like for a Raspberry Pi. We've got a device that has a pins collection and we have a concrete type that you can use to get those pins through IntelliSense. So now let's take a look at some simple IO examples. Generally speaking, there are three types of simple basic IO that you might be using. One is digital IO. That is a simple Boolean state. It's either off or it's on. Off being zero volts, on being whatever the logic voltage of your platform is. The Feather F7, that logic voltage is 3.3. On a Raspberry Pi, it is five. So it might change somewhat, but really digital simply means either there is no voltage there or voltage is present at the logic level. The second one is an analog. Analog is a range of voltage from zero to typically the upper range is also the same as the logic voltage. Those are divided into a specific set of resolution. So it might be say 12 bits. So you have zero to 3.3 volts spread out across 12 bits of data. 
The last one is the PWM or pulse width modulation. Basically, it's a square wave that is output by the device and you can change the frequency and the duty cycle of that in order to generate a, a simulated or an average analog output voltage. So for a digital IO, again, this is reading or writing platform voltage, turning on something like an LED as a classic example. You would create the port and then you just set its state, either true or false, and the voltage will go to whatever the logic level is on your platform. Same thing for reading. You create a digital input port on the pin and then you read its input state and it'll give you either a true or false whether or not it has voltage or not. Analog inputs, they're used to read that voltage range. So we create an analog input port telling it which pin that we want to use and then we read that voltage. One thing that's important to mention here is that comes back not as some float or double number, but it comes back as a voltage unit struct. Almost all of our sensors in Meadow Foundation use units so that you don't have this confusion about what type of uh, number is that. Is it Fahrenheit? Is it Celsius? It, it is very, very definitive on what the value is it also provides conversions for you so you don't have to do that math in your own code. Again, PWMs generate a square wave. For this, all you have to do is you create a PWM port, giving it some options, the frequency that you want to drive it at and the duty cycle. In this case, 50% duty cycle at 500 Hertz. These are really commonly used for driving things like piezo speakers and servos. Next in complexity are the communication buses. Typically a communication bus uses multiple wires and they have some sort of a standard protocol for communication to peripheral devices. The common one that most people are familiar with is a serial port. It's often called a UART in the scope of communication buses, these are pretty slow. They often will have just a single device connected to serial, though some serial does allow multiple devices. And they're pretty good for longer distance. You can run these, you know, meters in distance and through noisy environments. There are some different variations like RS-232, RS-485, and TTL. A second common one is I2C or I squared C stands for interintegrated circuit. This is a very, very common protocol. It's used for most of the peripherals that you'll find in Meadow Foundation. Next is SPI or SPI, which is the serial peripheral interface. This is a higher speed multi-device bus uh, commonly used for displays. So serial ports, Again, these are probably the most familiar to you as a developer. These are accessed in Meadow Core by serial port name rather than just a string name. And that's because, especially on some Linux devices, COM1 might also be referred to as a device called dev TTYS0 or something along those lines. So it has multiple names that equal the same thing. We have in Meadow Core two flavors, if you will, of creating and accessing a serial port. One is a classic serial port class, which will be familiar if you've used serial ports before, and the other is a serial message port. The classic serial port API, you open the port and you read and write bytes. It's up to you to do any type of interpretation of those bytes, do parsing, that kind of thing. The serial message port, on the other hand, allows you to tell it when you create it what a delimiter might be before or after the message, or if you're using fixed length messages, you can tell it how long they are, and the serial message port will do the parsing for you and raise events with just the messages already parsed for you. For I squared C, this is a two-wire bus, and so you can have multiple peripherals on the bus. 
they're all addressed with a seven bit address. So as long as you don't have address collision, you can have many different devices on the bus. These are good for short distances, think centimeters at the most, typically things all inside of one enclosure. So from your uh, platform hardware to say a temperature sensor or a light sensor, something along those lines. Just like most things in Meadowcore, you just create the bus and then you pass that bus and the peripheral into your hardware driver. Accessing I squared C is really simple. You create the bus using the device and then you pass that bus and the address into your peripheral driver. SPI, it's a little bit more complex. It's got a minimum of three wires Plus it has another line called a chip select that you drive low when you want to select it. That way you can again have multiple devices on the bus and select which one you're talking to at any given time. What this means is that in order to create that peripheral, you have to pass it the bus and the chip select line that you're going to use. Again, this is typically short distance, something inside the enclosure with your platform hardware. Here you can see an example of how it works. You create the bus. In some cases, you might need to provide the speed or the mode, though most of the drivers in Meadow Foundation, that's internal to the driver. So it already knows the speed and the mode that it needs to run at, so you don't have to provide it. But then you provide that bus and the chip select port down to the peripheral when you construct it. A couple more things that might be familiar to .NET developers. First, Meadowcore has a service resolver built in. It's a static, it's very, very lightweight, doesn't have a lot of frills and options because we are an embedded platform. It allows only singletons, so it doesn't have multi-instance capability, but it does support things like constructor and property injection. It is initially populated with the, a logger, which we'll talk about here in just a second, the iMeadow device instance, so the device that is created, and an instance of your iApp that is running. Here at the bottom is a very simple example of usage. We can create a service and register it by type, and then at some point later in our application or some other area in our application, we can retrieve that by interface. Again, you can use property or constructor injection when you are building these. There's more in depth to the resolver. So if you have questions, feel free to ask those or go ahead and take a look at our documentation online. Lastly, we have a simple log provider. It is again available in the resolver, but it is designed to be a lightweight, extensible logging framework. We use it internally. So certain components when they are coming up at boot up will report out the logger. It's got different log levels, so you can filter logs as they come out. You can see here we've got logging debug, info, or error level messages, and you can filter them by setting the log level at runtime, or you can set them in your app config for at startup. So there you have it. A real quick tour of the Meadow Core stack and how you would use that through your applications. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. We'll try to answer them. And I hope you have a good dev camp.